Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you're not alone. This is an issue that people, states, and individuals, and organizations are facing much of, in much of North America and in much of Europe as well. And uh, so, and, and typically people um, you know, use lethal, lethal means to quote unquote solve these problems, but uh, the thing is it's, it's often uh, not very uh, enduring. It, it's sort of an endless cycle. So, so I've, been, I've, I've been doing this for 15 years and, and I, I've become convinced that in almost all cases it's more economical to to spend the money up front and build some good non-lethal defenses of key points um, than, to, than to constantly uh, remove beavers and, and repair whatever damages uh, have, have been caused uh, before the beavers are removed. Um, and, and, and also, I mean, I'm a bio wildlife biologist and, and the only reason I got into this work is because I want to make the landscape healthier and more productive. I want to produce more wildlife and, and of course you know, beavers are a, a marvelous uh, keystone species. The, the wetlands they create support a lot of life and so the, the only way to, to uh, effectively protect something like a road culvert is to either do a, a flow device, a general term I use, or to extirpate the beavers. And you can't just say, oh, well, we'll just take a few beavers. It only takes one beaver to, to clog a culvert. So, so it has to be, you know, you can't have any beavers in this, you know, in an ecosystem for a long distance, you know, permanently. And so a lot of ecological value is lost with that approach. And, uh, and so I've just seen it um, at hundreds and hundreds of sites, the, the almost miraculous um, growth of, of really high value wildlife habitat at these conflict points that happens over the years by just simply uh, being able to to uh, leave the beavers in place and let them do their thing. Of course every site's different. They're all different. And, and the West is very different than where, you know, most of my, especially agricultural areas in the West with all this irrigation stuff is, is very different than a lot of my experience in the East. And, but Generally speaking, long, narrow canals are the, are the hardest places to defend because it's, it, it's so easy for a beaver to, to put a new dam in because it's not very broad. And so this is a, a challenging place. Um, and uh, but it, the, the first thing I do whenever I get to a site is to, uh, is to look at it and, and try to get a sense of what the, the landowner's goals are and make sure they're aware of, you know, that, uh, of the threats or how, how the threats are, how limited they may be. People often exaggerate the threats and, and aware of the possibilities for improving uh, habitat nearby. And so uh, at this site, I mean, as, you, as you, I'm sure you've all seen, there's a beaver dam there. Um, folks don't want beaver dams in here, but the river is nearby, so beavers you know, they're great dispersers and they're coming in here um, fairly regularly. Um, but when you, man when you put a flow device, and, and I'll, I'll just I'll use another general term, a pipe system, there's two basic types of conflict points. Regular beaver dams and uh, narrow man-made outlets like road culverts. And so they, they, they require a different approach. And so when you put a, a and it, just generally, uh, fence systems at culverts, pipe systems at um, beaver dams. You always have to add a pipe. And frequently I, I use a combination of strategies at a culvert site. I build a fence and then I add a pipe system to that uh, just as added security. And so at, at beaver dams I often tell people uh, that, that you should try to manage the height of the dam. And, and the, the basic goal of a pipe is to is to control the vertical growth of the dam at, at a level that, that you're comfortable with. Um, and so I tell people, you know, manage it as high as, you, as you're comfortable with, as you can tolerate and still protect your properties. Because if, with this dam, for example, if we, if we put a pipe in there and drain the water really low, and of course there's gonna be great fluctuations here, uh, from what I understand, just like there is in almost all natural uh, streams, um, 
but anyways, if, if you know most of the year, let's say it's it's relatively low flow, and a pipe will hold the water down. These pipes are not going to be that big, but they'll hold the water down most of the time, and so that controls the vertical growth of the dam, because beavers are, are you know typically are are building the dam right at the water surface, uh, responding to stimuli. So if you can hold the water down, then the dam won't grow. Um, at any rate, if, if we did put, put the pipe in really low here, then you'd create a, a, a long stretch of shallow water areas that, that increases the likelihood of new beaver dams, because dams typically get started in relatively shallow spots. And so the water is actually part of the defense against beaver dams. Um, and, and the beaver dam t as well is part of a pipe system. It, it, you know, they have to go together. If you go in there with a giant pipe and a real insensitive and, and essentially destroy the beaver dam, well the beavers are either going to leave or the dam's going to you know, wash away and then you just have a pipe system there. Uh, and it's, it has, it's not going to, it's not going to be doing anything. So you, you just have to, have to, you know, sensitively put the two together and try to, you know, find that middle ground where you have the, you know, most water you can tolerate, but are still protecting the property. So, so that's our challenge down there. Um, and here we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll build a fence here. And I, I don't know if, if, uh, if, if folks want another fence, but there's also, you know, the, you're, you're always doing this at the upstream end of culverts. So we'd also put one over there if, uh, if the uh, managers of this property want that. Um, I, I welcome any questions at any time. I, I, I kind of want to apologize right up front because this is a, it's a, it's a slow methodical process. And, and I'm, I'm always very methodical because the, the, the little things really count. It's very, very easy to fail when you're making these things. And so you want to go slow, do a good job, and be very thoughtful. In addition to that, these are you know relatively tight little areas to work, so not a lot of people can be involved. But uh, I'll try to I'll try to get as much people active in the process as possible. Can you talk a little bit about just the flight history of beavers? Um, yeah, I can. Every time I come west, I'm just amazed at how dry the air is. <laughs> I can, and I mean, we could talk all day easily about beavers, and, and so that's why I, re I really welcome questions at any time. Because it's actually easier for me to respond to questions because you know the life history of beavers is such a broad subject, and so I could go on and <laughs> on and on and on. You know, I, I hate to launch into that without if, if there's some specific so area of it that would interest you. Yeah, well, it depends on where you are on the continent. <clears throat> My beavers in Vermont are, are, are locked inside their lodge for four months now. Uh, I was just in California, in Martinez, and those beavers, uh, they, had it, they have it so easy. You know, <laughs> as you, you know, most of you probably know, in the colder areas where ice develops, beavers have to build a, a food cache just to survive the winter that they can access underneath the ice. And in, in, in Martinez, no, those beavers, no, no cash there. It's December, no cash, no ice. So. They can eat tulies all year. Though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, it, it really varies regionally, but. Uh, That's really what it is. Yeah. What? What would be the main diet of the beaver out here? Uh, corn and alfalfa are right here. <laughs> 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 no. um, but I just, uh, before the, your question, I had a, another thought um, that, that I, I mean, nature is so complex and these, every species is so complex. And with beaver, I mean, it's different. There's a lot of differences region to region and in the continent and site to site. So I, and I'm always saying, you know, typically or generally, because there's, there's, it's just, it's, it's a real danger to generalize and make broad statements about animals. <coughs> What's the success rate in terms of the percentage of these that actually work, and what's the longevity? Well, that really depends on who's building them. If you build them. Yeah. Well, I like to say 100%. <laughs> um, I, I, I've, I've really had a lot of success, you know, 
at, at hundreds of sites in, in many, many areas. Um, I, I haven't found a site I couldn't do. But, but I mean, but it's, a, it's very hard to define success, you know? People define it in many ways. I mean, it doesn't eliminate beavers. If, if you build a flow device here and then beavers build a dam up there, some people say, well, that hasn't been successful. But it's, that's really not being fair because we're, when you talk about success, you're talking about this specific flow device, which is not a, not a mechanism to exterminate all the beavers in the area. But the flow devices themselves can be very successful if they're well done. And, and I try, my goal is, I think it's most economical to use the most um, durable structures, the most long-lasting materials, and, and so that's my goal. And, um, it, but keep in mind that flow devices that have a different components that some of which are more durable than others. I, I use wood, I think it's, it's a lot better to, to work with, to build with, than steel in, in my experience. I use pressure-treated wood, so that has a certain lifespan pretty good one but it's certainly in the eastern forest where it's very acidic and I, I don't know how this would compare to that um, the steel is the first thing to go because of the, 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 the below the water line and so as a result I've for years I've used the heaviest mesh I, I can find the heaviest wire which is quarter inch diameter but that actually goes pretty fast you may only get 10 years out of that and, and that I'm not satisfied with that I would really like to think that all the all the flow devices will last 30 years or something, you know, like that. So recently, I've started using an epoxy coated mesh, and I think well, I will get decades out of that. And then the third major component is the uh, the plastic uh, polyethylene pipes, and I think they'll last you know, decades too. So the, the stuff can be pretty durable, particularly if you use heavy wire and maybe. I don't know about here, you have to wait and see how the steel holds up, but maybe epoxy coated uh, wire. <clears throat> Question. You said that on something like this, you're going to put pipes on one, uh, fence on one side, pipes on the other, right? On the upside. Yeah, something like that. Okay. We, we, we got these two distinctive types of situations, the beaver, regu quote unquote regular beaver dam, even though it's in a canal, which isn't that typical, in a road culvert. Okay, and on the road culvert, you're doing what? Well, I'll start by building a little fence. Okay. Yeah, that, to exclude, to prevent the beavers from directly clogging the culvert. Okay, that lines my question. So, on one side is your fence, and on the other side is the pipe, correct? Or it's just the fence? Just the fence. It's all the same. The pipe goes in the beaver dam. But but I may do a com okay. I may do a combination. I may okay. do a combination here. We have here. some of these. My question is, do you put the fence on both sides? Or just on one? Typically not. Typically Even not. If we have a dam up. Say your fence, fence is on the upside, so he puts a dam down here, and you've already put your ditches, so he moves up. Or you've already put your pipe in your dam, and he moves up above. Let's see. Never mind. I answered my own question. Okay, never mind. Because the fence is already there. What well, we'll have issues with where I am, we'll have a culvert, and that's all he's blocking is a culvert. And then I was wondering if he moves above, do you end up putting another fence above to keep him out? But never yeah, a pipe system. If he okay. moves upstream away from the culvert, it's probably a, it'll be a beaver dam, and then that'll be a pipe system. But okay, cool. We're basically just, and you know, I use two words interchangeably, the word fence and the word filter. And I think filter's a really good word because we're using this mesh to filter beavers out and water in. And, and so we're, even if it is a you know road culvert versus a beaver dam, we're still just talking about pipes and filters with filters on the end of them. In one one instance, instance, you're stuck with what's there. It's usually very big, much bigger than the pipes you put in beaver dams. And it also ends. It ends right at the edge of the dam. Let's call roads dams because that's basically what they are with small holes in them. So you have a pipe under here, but it ends at the edge of the dam and it's very big, so I can't just attach another pipe to it. If this was a 10 inch pipe, I, I would just attach a pipe to it and run it out to a filter. I'd treat it just like a beaver dam. But that's not the, the way it usually is, so you're forced to, to build a fence around the culvert first. And sometimes you can get by with just a fence. And, and every site's different. That's why this is gonna take, to get good, it's gonna take you know, a lot of experience, a lot of practice. Uh, but in other cases, uh, you know, as I said, a fence, you, you got to prevent the beavers from directly clogging the culvert and then with a, probably a pipe system with a filter on the end of it for added security. 
Um, now the, the, the filters, they need to be coarse, relatively coarse. You know, one by one inch by one inch filter is going to clog with a lot of floating debris, even if beavers aren't even evolved. And so, uh, and, and, you're, and you're restricted to what industry makes. And so the, the best all around size is what we have here today. It's a six by six inch mesh. Um, it's not, it's, it's, there's, there's nothing, you know, industry doesn't make the so-called perfect size. They make four by four inch and six by six inch. And on occasion I've used in very shallow sites, I've used hog panels, they're, you know, they're graduated um, for the fencing, but they're so short, you can only do it in shallow sites. But beavers come in all sizes. There's a lot of dynamism and complexity in these, in these situations, it's just not simple. And so on occasion, or, or you know, a number of times in recent years, I've had small beavers, typically yearlings, um, going through the six by six inch mesh and cl clogging the heck out of a culvert. Um, so I like the six by six inch because it's coarse and it's made by industry. It's generally it's ideal, but it's not perfect. So sometimes, sometimes, and, and another issue you have with, with putting fences on streams, it's a darn shame we have to do it at all. Um, when I'm thinking of other wildlife using these corridors as movement. But the six by six inch mesh allows most animals, muskrats and otters and so forth, to go right through. It, it only blocks most beavers and large turtles. So um, sometimes, I, I just generally I like to just build the fence, leave it coarse, and then if I happen to have, and again, it's, it's a minority of, this, of the cases, and so I, I don't want to build everything for the, for the minority of situations. I want to build for the, you know, for, for most, most, you know, what happens generally. And so I, I prefer to leave it coarse for the, for the reasons I've stated, and then if I do have problems with small beavers clogging it, to then respond. And I, and I respond by taking a, a second piece of fencing and putting it over the first piece and staggering it. So you could essentially have three by six inch holes. And then th that ends it. No beavers will go through that. And I just do it down near the water line where beavers, where beavers pass. You don't have to do it on the whole fence. Yes, sir. Question, in, in most of these systems, one of the big problems and one of the big complaints we get from whatever the land management agency happens to be is they'll plug the culverts or they'll put a dam in. Then they dig bank dens. And the bank dens causing the erosion that occurs around them hence happens to be the main problem and the main complaint we get a lot of times. How do you deal with that? Well, it, that, I don't <laughs> generally. In, gen, in my experience, generally, you know, the, the big issue is, that, say, a clogged road culvert or, or flooding in general. And that's really been the focus. I, I rarely you know, get situations where people say we're, they're, they're digging tunnels and could you do something. It's a, that's a tough one, though. It's yeah, a tough one. Gonna, if, yeah. if they're going to be there, they're going to live somewhere, and the yeah. bank dens are yep. the options. Here, so. Yeah, yeah, and they're tremendous diggers. I, I mean, a, a, about the only thing you could do is, uh, you know, is put some mesh, lay some mesh over the over the hole, you know, get the beavers out of there, then try to block it. But it's, uh, you know, and I think those holes are generally fairly close to the water line. Yeah. They, they don't, they're not real deep. You know, an, another thing that, that I, I notice with human psychology is, is that a lot of times we, we tend to exaggerate fears and we do a lot of what ifing. What, what if that happens or this happens and that happens? And, and, you know, just to be safe then, we say, well, let's just eradicate all the beavers. But, but uh, you know, sometimes th these, these dangers and threats are, are, are less... Uh, you know, turn out to be less than we might anticipate. And again, every site's different. You know, you, you have to gauge the value of the property that's potentially being threatened. If the interstate's right there, and the beavers are in this area are doing a lot of digging, you know, that's that's a that's a pretty serious issue. So, you have to take take it in a case by case basis. What is the durability or longevity in areas with uh, with flood events? I mean. If you get a flood event, if you come in here and, and let's say well, it's not, of course this is a low flow drain, but um, a culvert on a road someplace in, in the mountains and it's blocking it and it washes it out. So you put one of these in and then you get a summer storm flood event. Is 
it going to is it going to stay there or yeah. is it going to wash out or yeah generally it will stay there i mean if it has to be built well and thoughtfully but uh, but you make a good point I, I mean these systems are so dynamic and and, and uh, it, it's a it's a serious challenge to build something in a stream that will last uh, that will survive the floods and, and in the north, you know, the ice, the force of ice pushing on it is tremendous. And then you have acid and, and uh, siltation and, and other issues. But uh, gen in Virginia once, and they have enormous floods there. I don't know whether it's uh, hurricane rains or what, but boy, I showed up to work down there and, and there'd be a little tiny trickle of a stream and four or five six foot diameter culverts lined up on the highway. I was really intimidated. I said, what the hell is this all about? Um, and, and at one site down there, they had, I could, the rip, they put too much riprap on the shoulder of the bank around the culvert, and I couldn't even drive my first two posts. I just kind of piled stones up around them. I drove the front posts. T typically, these things are just four posts, and uh, that thing got picked up and swept over the road and <laughs> ended up in the Atlantic Ocean. But that's the only time that's ever happened, and, and that it probably wouldn't have if I could have gotten those posts in. But it's really important to get the posts in just as far as you can. And uh, then I, I often use diagonal braces. And so I can build a pretty rugged structure on a, on a, you know, on a piece of ledge if I have to with, with dia you know, bracing and stuff. You know, fortunately, you usually have a little bit better substrate than that. But that, you know, they, just like everything else, they're, they're, they're always different. And it's, it's more challenging to build in a rocky substrate, obviously. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't recommend that. I just think that right off the bat represents a whole bunch of maintenance. And it would be a weaker flow device, too. It's, it's, it would be a greater <laughs> chance that the beavers would defeat it. Well, it's just that if a big boulder came down and was crashed into the fence yeah. and destroyed it. Yeah, you're going to have to replace it. Yeah, but that's pretty rare. I mean, that's pretty rare. Skip. One, yeah. Sorry. Oh, I, I just had one thought. Will you hold your question, yes. please? Thank you. One thing about beaver damming habitat is it's, it's pretty low energy environments generally. Uh, small streams, low gradient areas, because beavers don't want to live in a, a place you know where there's too much uh, pitch. Then, then the force, the force of the water, when it comes in large volumes, is going to destroy their dam. That means they have to do a whole lot more work. They have to build a new dam. It makes them more vulnerable to predators. Um, plus, they have to build a much higher, higher dam a lot more energy involved to create a relatively small wetland. So they like flat areas, small streams, uh, not a lot of energy. So that's generally what you're dealing with, so. Back to what Debbie was saying, where I'm from in northern New Mexico, we have strong runoff. And generally the beaver dams do get washed out every yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's pretty continuous. Um, putting a fence across, there's no way that, that that would work without making a dam bigger than the beaver dam every every time. Yeah. But there's a there's one dam on on a creek up there that I that we worked on. And we put the four by four mesh in a circle around the end of the pipe. It's about a about a four foot round circle. The pipe then goes into the center of that circle. And actually, it's a big enough dam where we have three 10-inch pipes going through the dam. And there's, so there's three circular things of mesh around each yep. pipe. So there's lots of free space for the yeah. river to flow. And that one held up through yeah. the runoff. Well, that's my invention. Is it? <laughs> it's called the round fence. Okay. Yeah, and we'll be making one today. Okay. But, but thank you for, for noting that, because that is a really good, a good uh, filter. Um, and, and, and you made some other really important points, too. It, because uh, yeah, even when I build a fence on a culvert, like here, even in a very narrow area, I, I, I want to be very careful to not to put the fence across the, the whole thing. And that's, you know, I guess that, that helps with the floods, but it also creates a salient down the middle that makes it a, a, a more difficult place for beavers to dam. Whereas, you know, right across, it, you know, if you're just welcoming a dam, if you build one right across from bank to bank. 
Um, and, and again, I, I'm, I'm spending a lot of my time talking people out of flow devices because, and, and, and myself out of business because I, I want to capture as, as much ecological value as possible on the landscape. But in, in, re, in those situations, and, and it's, it's, it's relatively rare in my experience that beavers build dams in, in situations where they do get destroyed every year because it's so uneconomical. And I've seen it a little bit in certain places during low flow periods, and I, I call them summer dams. And they, they never really amount to much, and then they disappear the next winter. But uh, in, in, in a lot of those situations, if it's really like that, depending, you know, I, I would just never recommend a flow device. I'd say just wait until the floods destroy them. You know, don't, don't spend your money. Of course, every site's different. And you may have uh, some super high value property right there that, that, that changes the dynamic a little bit. Yeah, you know, so. And that's, that's part of the problem we have here is that we do have a bimodal moisture events. Basically, we have the winter stuff, and then we have another one in yeah. the summer. And on any given year, either one or neither of those could destroy the dams that are available and or wash anything that's had a culvert out. So it's it's one of those things. Sometimes it's, it may be difficult to get around that. Oh, I understand. It's and replacement every couple of years. Yep. Yep, and that's why you know you guys will have to be the judges and and uh, you know and understand that there every site's different. But you know I just encourage people to you know we also as a species tend to tend to focus on the negative sometimes and, and damage and and uh, as you've already already uh, perceived uh, when it comes to beavers at least I don't have that problem and and I but I think my point is I think it's important to try to try to recognize the diversity of values associated with beavers and to try to weigh that in the equation as to whether you're just going to extirpate them or whether you're going to try to try to you know create some uh, non-lethal defenses but uh, I, yeah I think you, you have to and, and again I I'm talking as a person I've studied beavers my whole life and and I, I've been focusing on this flow device thing for 15 years and so I, I have a huge advantage, I, and, I, and that gives me a lot of confidence that I can do it. But, but that takes years to develop. You know, nobody's going to have that. I, anybody can develop it, but it's going to take time. And that's that's the greatest weakness. in, let's say, you know, nationally, you know, beaver proofing ourselves, our infrastructure. That's the greatest uh, bottleneck right there. So there. There's so few of those people. And so, you know, I, I suspect, you know, with all the talent you have in New Mexico. Over the years, you're going to create lots of them if you want to, if, if you think this is an important issue. Um, but in the interim, in the interim, you know, you you have to defend yourselves, and so you have to, you're going to have to have that lethal option available. Skip. Yeah, oh, yeah, we'll be right back. Um, do you have any sense of how often the beavers say, "Well, you messed up my habitat. I'm moving," or uh, how often they? Yeah. Again, it's uh, every single habitat, every site's different. But generally, generally, it it does not mean that the beavers move. Usually, I, I'll protect a road culvert, and the, there'll be a, a dam up there, away from the road. That you know, a dam in a wetland that, that that won't that doesn't threaten properties, and the beavers are can stay in the general area. Generally, the case, and generally, it's it, in my experience, it's led to enormous ecological and wetland values being gained. It's more, the, the more human manipulation of the landscape, the more difficult and complex it becomes to, to capture those values. And there's nothing, nothing uh, you know, worse than an agricultural area where you have irrigation ditches in that regard. But you find in, in your more natural, uh, unhuman manipulated environments, you'll, the opportunities for grabbing those values would be much greater. You're going to put this fence around this culvert, and I know this is a low flow drain. Everybody may not know what the low flow drain is, but it don't carry a lot of water. But at times, this thing last summer when we was getting all the rains, this thing flooded. Okay, we have culverts that stop up with weeds by themselves. So how are we going to maintain a six by six space I mean, how's it going to be practical to keep the weeds out of this thing? Yeah. You can't be here every day. Yeah. Well, you, you'll just have to see how it goes, but um, I, I hopefully it won't require very much maintenance, and that's generally the, the case. You know. Uh, 
you know, the fences are, are built pretty low for one thing, you know, for, you know, for a reason. I, I, I want, during big flow events, I want the water to flow, pour over the top of those fences. Even if the fence gets totally clogged, I want the water to pour over the top of it. I never want my fences to be the limiting factor uh, during a flood event. I don't want to get blamed. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and it reminds me of another issue, though, too. You, you know, you're probably still saying, well, you're putting these, and, and again, this, you know, this tremendous variance in flows is not unusual in my experience. In the east, it's, 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 it's the same thing. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I have to reemphasize the fact that the goal of a pipe system, and I'm not talking about the culvert now, is to, is to essentially control the size of the beaver dam. It's expected during a high water event for the, be the, the water to pour over the dam, temporarily at least. But it's going to be going over a dam that's much lower than it would have been otherwise. And so you, typically you don't need a very big pipe to, to, to control the growth of that dam. You only need, a, need to move enough of the water, enough of the <coughs> damming season, and that's usually during low flow periods when beavers are damming. They're not out there damming during floods or when it's iced up. If you can move enough of the water during those periods, then that'll, that'll hold the water down most of the time. And so during those, those months that it's being held down by your relatively small pipe, because beavers <coughs> typically dam at the water, you know, water line, that dam's not going to grow. It's a very effective way to control damming. And, and, and beavers, again, as, econ as economists, they are so sensitive to, to habitats that, that aren't, aren't uh, rich enough for them. And so you, you, start, you control a dam too much. And, you know, and, and combined with a, another variable you always have to factor in is the quality of the habitat. But if you have a low, relatively low quality habitat, and then you also make it drier you know, by making the dam uh, smaller, it's, you really increase the likelihood that the beavers are just going to, at some point, they're going to, in the near future, they're going to find someplace else. I just wanted to point out that um, this, this was actually a couple feet higher last night, right? Yeah, and yeah, he, yeah, that's a good point. He just stomped on the dam a little bit and yeah. the water level totally dropped, so that would be a good option in situations where Absolutely. a yeah. would get yeah. flooded out anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, you can just maintain it by yeah. taking apart the dam. Yeah. It People are often intimidated by beaver dams, and they think it's more difficult to destroy them than it is. But uh, it, it, you know, it's I, I just find it really easy if you do it do it in a certain way. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, it's I didn't I didn't even have a tool. You know, in five, in five minutes I had a huge gap in it, but. Yeah, this dam's primarily made out of cattails. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, but if it's if it's a, a more uh, a challenging combination of materials, I mean, typically it's it's got some sticks in it, and, and I just and they're usually kind of more on the top of the surface, and you know, I just take those off by hand, and then the best tool is is a, a little cultivator, three or four prong cultivator, and you just start start digging, and and, and you use the water the water itself flowing to sweep away a lot of that stuff. And, uh, and this, this, this is a great technique, too. I mean, this is what I was doing. I was just going like this, and you know, it just creates a lot of erosion or, or kicking. Um, another thing that, to, to be aware of is that if, if you do want to, and sometimes, you, you know, even if you, if, you, if you plan on doing a flow device, you, you can't get to it soon enough, you know, so you have to do something, um, you know, just to control the dam in, in the meantime. And, the, the best way to do that is not to just put a breach, you know, one breach in one part of the dam, because that's very easy for the beavers to reestablish that. If you do the, the skim a little bit off the whole length of the dam, then it takes much longer for that water to come back up again. And oftentimes you can just do that by walking along it and stomping like this, and letting the water carry the fine sediments away. And oftentimes a, a pipe system through a beaver dam anyways, I'll, I'll put two together, so two pipe minimum. Generally use, um, you, you're, again, you're restricted uh, by what industry makes in terms of the size of your pipe and um, by what you can, you know, comfortably move around. And so I, I rarely, occasionally I'll use 15-inch pipes, pretty rarely. Those are really big. 
generally more than you need. Um, a more, and then there's 12 inch pipes, use those sometimes. I guess if I had to choose one that was really ideal, my favorite would be a 10 inch pipe. Sometimes I'll use eight and sixes. You, you just gotta get a general feel. And it's more than just the size of the watershed when you're trying to decide on how much water you need to move. It's also the, the length of the dam um, because beaver dams have leaks in, in them and so forth. So, so sometimes, and, and it, the quality of the habitat also influences my decisions. I say, you know, how long do you, you, know, I, you know, I think beavers are going to be here. Are they going to be a permanent presence because this is a great habitat or can I just do something, uh, you know, a little smaller, you know, just to discourage them and tip the balance of the equation in my favor. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, on very rare occasions, very rare occasions. Uh, again, I talked about the, the weight of these things, and, and I, I do much of this work alone. And I can, so I can do a 15-inch pipe system alone. It's not easy, but, but easily do 12s and 10s alone because the pipes are polyethylene, the black pipes, and they're a lot lighter. The PVC is, is way heavier, way heavier. And, uh, and so... Uh, I would use it. I would use it in real low flow situations, maybe. Um, you know, six inch pipes, not not that heavy. It also isn't flexible. Having a little bit of flex in your pipe is advantageous. Generally, you wanna you wanna hump them over the dam just a little bit. And uh, that that's the, the reason for that is to to make sure the intake of your pipe is remains underwater because then the water acts as a silencing mechanism. If, if, if the beavers hear water running you know, at your filter, they're going to key on it, even if it's well away from the dam. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there on the internet if you look it up, and a lot of people are, are using something called a flexible, flexible pipe or a flexible leveler, and um, I, I, I never use that, because all that is is it's these uh, culverts or pipes, these black pipes, but it's just single walled and so a, a single wall these are double walled so they're they're smooth have a smooth interior as a result they're almost twice as hydrodynamically efficient and so if, if you're using a small pipe anyways it's it's nice to be able to get as much water through it as possible and in addition they're more uh, they're more durable they'll probably hold up maybe just to sunlight a little bit better occasionally beavers will chew on them so a little bit better defense against that uh, and in, the, in these smaller sizes I've mentioned, they, the double wall pipes still flex enough to, to, to get that done. 15 inches are, don't really, but 12s and certainly 10s and 8s flex fine, even when they're double walled. So I, I, one thing I, I didn't mention when I talked about filters, and this applies more to, to filters on, on pipes on, in beaver dams. You want, you want a good ratio between the, the filter size and the amount of water you're pulling through it. If you get that wrong and, and you have a real small filter and, and a big pipe, then the beavers are going to swim by and they're going to they're gonna get, be able to get close enough to really sense that flow and then they're likely to key on it. So it has to be, you have to have a good ratio there. It has to be a, a, you know, a very durable uh, material that the filter is made out of. And then in addition to that, you have to have good separation distance. You could have a great ratio and put that filter right in front of the beaver dam, and it, it would be a lot more vulnerable and could fail. Any other questions? You know, oh yeah, this is, when I looked at that dam, it reminded me of another thought I had. The reason I breached that is because um, and, you know, we, we're going to work up here, so every inch of water you can get down, the easier it is to, to build something. It's very hard to build something in the water anyways. So that's, that's the, the first thing to do. I don't, you know, the beavers didn't re, re, uh, didn't patch the breach last night, so they may not even be here, but they will, they will uh, patch it at some point. Um, so it really makes no difference how we approach this, what we do first, but, uh, but generally my approach is because um, I don't like wearing my waders as much as I like wearing jeans. I'll do whatever I can on the dry land but first and then, then put the waders on. So why don't we just adopt that strategy and 
what we'll do is we'll build a round fence. <coughs> and I, I don't know if we're going to need more than one. We definitely need one there. Um, you know, I went, there's a second dam down there. I went down to that. It's really, it's really a tiny dam. It doesn't seem like it merits anything at this point. And then there's, you know, there's possibilities here. If folks, and you've got to give me some feedback, if what, you know, depending on what folks want. You could protect that, and you could protect this. That's, you know, this, this, I can, I can, I can justify this. It's a little harder over there because the, 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 the upstream ditch is not much wider than the culvert. I think you still have to, you still have to protect the culvert, but, but my point is it's very easy for the beavers just to build a dam anywhere above there, even easier than this ditch, which is bigger. So, I often um, get my waders on and, and really familiarize myself with, with the site where the system's going to be because I, I don't know for sure how deep it is until I do that. Um, and then I, I get a, a sense of how big I want to build that round fence, that filter. And uh, so in this, in, a, in this situation, it'll be four, uh, five or six feet, feet in diameter. If I make it too big, it's going to... The edges of it are going to be, it's going to be too much of a barrier across the whole channel, you know, that may become a beaver dam in itself. So I want to keep it, keep it narrow, but on the other hand, I want to have an acceptable ratio. So five or six feet is, is what it will be. It doesn't have to be very tall. It's pretty shallow down there, probably only two and a half feet. I like, it's, it's kind of a waste of materials if you're, you know, you have a bunch of filter that's, you know, above the average water line. So usually don't have to be much, you know, two feet, two and a half, occasionally three feet tall. So we'll start cutting up some fencing and uh, make, make a round fence. Um, I'll show you, I've got one little specialty tool here that's just wonderful. Excuse me. Another thing I didn't mention, we, we do have a, a variety of, of, of different gauges here, the, the diameter of the wire. And, uh, you know, of course, I, I like the heaviest, and that's four, four gauge. So we'll start with that. Um, but it's kind of hard to bend, kind of hard to you know, do all this by hand. I'm not a welder. I suppose you could, you could try to weld stuff, but... No. But generally speaking, this is pretty easy to do it by hand. I think justifies that approach. Um, these are just little pipes, they're actually called nipples, a uh, six inch long nipple, and it's a quarter inch diameter, and that's a good, a good cheater tool for bending wire, which we're going to be doing a bunch of. I think the little, the little things really make a big difference when you're building something. And, you know, you have the right type of screw, it's, it's so much better than a bad screw, or a nail, or, you know, the wrong tools. You know, so just little things like having the right, you know, the right uh, diameter of a drill bit for the screws. These are just something I discovered recently. They're really neat because they have a, a big head. So very, very nice screws. You're welcome to check those out. And that's it. You don't need many tools. Bolt cutters are key. The bendy pipes, that's probably a better term for this, that, that little tool. And... Uh, that's about it. So let's uh, let's get to work. We can uh, we'll probably do it right out in here. Just gotta uh, cut it up to size first. You want that four gauge? Yeah, yeah. And bolt cutters. Really unusual size in my experience. Wow, those are big bolt cutters. Yeah, I, I don't have any here. Yeah. yeah. No. But you have some. I have not. Well, I have the basic stuff. I've I have not pieces. developed a, a detailed manual. Okay. It's, uh, it's so, on it the to do list. It depends so much on be, where you are. I mean, where you're working. Well, that's that's true. Yeah. That's true. Experience is so crucial. Right. Like people often make the mistake, you know, just sort of simplifying and saying, oh, "Flow devices work or they don't work." Uh -huh. And you know, so there's 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 
the statistics out there that they work 3% of the time or something. Oh, that's pretty low. And I'm thinking, well, you have to ask a couple questions. Who built it? How much, ex what are their credentials? And, and what does it look like, you know? Yeah. So yeah, experience is really key. And it's just, it, you just can't teach, you know, every single site I do yeah. is different, right. you know? Yeah. And then I, when I get there, I could, you know, do you know, probably three or four different strategies, usually mm -hmm. at culverts anyways, mm -hmm. is usually a number of ways I could approach it. And I, you know, I think and think about it and wait around and, and finally decide, well, this is the best one of all. Just cutting as close, as close to there as you can. That's, you know, these squares are six inches, so, you know, two and a half feet. Make sure you're on the, you know, that side of the wire. You, work, you know, right down through and do it. <laughs> These are impressive bolt cutters. At that end, you can start, and we can meet in the middle. Two and a half feet, which is uh, five squares. And you cut on the other side. Yeah, cut on that side at, at one. That's two. That's two up here. Two and a half. These are the, I'm, I'm starting to form up the walls of a round fence. Where's this? I guess I one. I guess this was on my pocket, wasn't it? Just, just popped off. Either pocket or, or um, you can do your belt. Okay. Pocket. Except, yeah, I'm yeah that's better. I'm going to put a lot bending over us. <coughs> um, the filter is a broader term. You know, round fence is a specific type of filter, but it certainly, is, but it's, it certainly is a filter. Yes. Yep. This is a type, a type of filter, Barbara. Yep. <laughs> Will you guys do that again? Uh, it doesn't really matter. You can do it on this one or do it on that one. Two and a, uh, two and a half feet, please. But do it from this side. Do it from this side. Two and a half feet. Call Jeff Cole at the email if you want to talk to him and ask him for suggestions. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's ideal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Beavers have a broad diet. Broad diet. Yeah. Yeah. They eat you know, all kinds of stuff other than trees. And so corn is just, yeah, tremendous. It's, oh, it's easy. It's, you know, high, high energy. Oh, absolutely. That's, that, that's probably the only reason they're out here. You know, because there's so, there's, there's very little willow along the waterway. You know, so that's, that's what, that's what keeps it, you know, makes it, uh, yeah. No, no. Okay, let me, uh. I'm really bad at math, so you're going to find I just keep measuring and repeating things just to be safe. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just hold it right on that, that, that wire there. Yeah. 14 and a half feet. 14 and a half feet. See if we can remember that. So you got to try to form this stuff into a circle, this, these walls. And that is done, but with this technique, if you excuse me. Another thing to keep in mind, I have scars all over my wrist to attest to this. When we use bolt cutters, it creates a very sharp point. You gotta be careful of that. In fact, uh, let's just turn it this way. Yeah, it's, uh, that's fair. I gotta, uh, let's roll it back on its back, if you will. It's got a little bit too much of a curve here. So I need to, oh yeah, the strips are over here. 
four and a half feet. I need four and a half feet of, of this. A, I, 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 oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Just want to make sure. <laughs> These are important calculations. You get your circle, your, your circumference right. I'm making a six foot diameter <coughs> circle. So that's a, that's a little bit less than a 19 foot circumference. So that's 14 and a half feet there, which means we need another four and a half feet. You have six inches? You tell me where. Let's see. This is how I often, I have to measure this. I walk every two squares, one foot, two feet, three feet, four feet, four and a half feet. Yep, on, on this side of that. On this side? Here? Yeah, uh, let's see. One, two, three, four and a half. Over here. Yeah. It's, uh, this, this stuff comes in a number of different sizes. The biggest sheet is 8 by 20 feet. And so with that stuff, you don't have to splice the walls. You have, you have your 19 feet that you need. So that's kind of nice, but, but the uh, disadvantage of that is just huge. And, and difficult to uh, to move. Um, this stuff is um, what 15 by 8, and I've also worked with stuff that's 7 by 14. And recently, because I've I've used that epoxy coated stuff, epoxy coated four gauge, it's not that common in the bigger sizes, but it is in a 5 by 10 foot uh, piece. So you can also do that with the 5 by 10 foot sheets. What it means is, I, is for the top and the bottom, which on the, on the six foot diameter round fence are six feet, you need, you need to put little splices. You can put a five foot sheet on, then just put a little, little splice with the same fencing in those holes. So that you may find that that's, that's easier for you to put in your pickup truck or whatever. And uh, it may be more practical, even though it's, it, it, it adds to the work of building large round fences more. And of course, it, that's just with a six foot, you know, sometimes if I use a 15 inch pipe, I'll have a eight foot diameter round fence on it. And then you really need the big sheets. You need eight foot, eight foot for the top and the bottom. For the, for the, and here's a term, I don't even know if I've used it yet, but my wooden frame fences are called beaver deceivers. That's a term I coined a long time ago. And for those, you have more flexibility and you can get by with smaller, smaller uh, raw materials. So the, the five by ten works pretty good for those. So, where's that little piece? Okay, thank you. much. <laughs> Probably doesn't m matter a whole lot to the beavers whether it's perfectly round or not, but <laughs> I'm really a kind of a perfectionist, so I like to get it as close to a circle as I can. Looks better. Okay. We'll just, uh, if we just slide that fence away just a little bit. I was, I was sort of, you know, get a sense of whether my my bending is about what I want. You want this out of the way too, Skip? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Not too bad, not too bad. I think I might flatten this just a little bit. I think I have to just be the one person to do it initially to make these splices because there's not much room to work. And I, I probably should be wearing gloves. I'll, I'll be real careful. It's a, it's a good idea because of these, these sharp uh, ends. Yeah. What? It, it doesn't matter.
And I know one thing about the West is it's absolutely full of fence building experts. And so that gives you a great advantage over the Easterners. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's all we can do. I, I was really glad to see that there's some tribal representatives here today. I, uh, much of my early experience with flow devices I got working for an Indian tribe in, in Maine called the Penobscot Nation. They have some great, beautiful land in northern Maine. Really rural, um, really nice uh, country. Great beaver habitat. Um, lots and lots of roads, not many people, it's pretty, pretty uh, low population density, but lots of roads because of the, um, the uh, forest products industry. But the thing is, you know, I, I was just working in Martinez, California, where they have a beaver dam right in the middle of town, and, and a lot of people say, well, this is no place, this is urban, there's no place for beavers. But it's, it's hard to draw that line between rural and urban. Um, because a clogged road culvert on those Penobscot lands in Maine, you know, it's just as serious an issue as it is in downtown Martinez. You can't have your road washed out. You have to be able to use the road. So it's a, it's a, a big time ur ur rural issue as well. Yeah, so it's, that's why it's really important to have the right circumference for the six foot or whatever size you're making. We can work with it whether it's a little, little big or a little small. That's fine. Yeah, it's it's, it's tough. It's, it's 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 rugged stuff. Even with a pipe, until you, until you get used to working with it and develop the right, you know, the specific muscles. So we can cut it off. We, if it's a little long, we can cut it off. Just yep, yeah, that's right. Let's go to yeah. Yep. What I do, guys, first is I go down three feet, you know, to find the center point. Three feet, and I do that, and and then I, I do it all four points in the middle, and that, you know that kind of locks my circle, you know, relatively relatively round. Yeah. Right there, and line it up with the wall. Just be very careful of those cut points on the wire. Make it do. Yeah, that's it. We want to make sure you have good, good overhangs. So. On a more general note, uh, you know, another thing that I found is that the beavers occupy a really tiny percentage of the landscape. Uh, it's somewhere in the order of one to two percent. I should rephrase that. No, no. I, if we want, you might want it out there. If that's yeah. if that's six feet, we want that. We, yeah, you know. I'm gonna cut that and bring it out. Hold on. Got me. Okay. Yeah, we don't need that one. Yeah, yeah. Leave the. Yeah, you got it. Yep. So uh, what I do is is. Uh, when I, when I bend, I, I put a little counter pressure with my left arm, and so I'm not sucking the wall in. So I, the wall will stay right there as I add pressure you know, through the bending process with my right hand. And if, if more people want to bend, there are, I think there's a, 
more pipes. Okay. Yeah, they're all out. I, I think I might have had five. Well, this I, I got two on me. <laughs> Anybody have a pipe? Bendy pipe? Thank you very much. If, oh yeah, I don't. I usually don't post it in. Yeah, I usually just set it there. And beavers will dig underneath things. You know, they're tremendous diggers. Uh, plus, it gives it a little more uh, structural integrity. But I, I mean, occasionally I'll do a small one where I, you know, given the given the situation, I just I actually leave prongs in the bottom and just stick it in. Generally, I think this is better, but, but you know, there's so many variations in, in terms of the dimensions and how it's done. Three feet? <laughs> yep, three feet from right here. One, two, three. Is that right? One, two, three. Yes. What's determining the size of the circle? Is this a standard size? Or is it <laughs> um, it's pretty standard. It, uh, it's, it's based on, on a, a couple things, sort of the width of the area that we have to place it in. If you made a great big one, that wouldn't be good. You want to have, yeah, oh yeah, no, just general, they're very general, but, you know, and, and it's, it's, you know, I want to have a good, healthy size filter for the size of the pipe. So the size of the pipe, for example, if I was using a 15-inch pipe, this would be too small. I'd want an eight-foot diameter round tank. Oh, wow. You know, so this is this. We're, we're we're putting a small pipe in here. This is going to be a really really favorable ratio. I think we're going to use the eight eight inch at the maximum ten inch pipe. Okay. So this is but yeah, that's the thing. You got to get that ratio right. And 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 it's always better to err on the side of caution. You know, or have it bigger. But most people when they do it, they'll you know people copy me. And and, and so I I go back to places. And, and I see these little tiny round fences with great big pipes going into them right next to the beaver dam. You know, and based on my based on my concept of a round fence, but it's so crucial. Every, you know, the ratios, of how you place it, all those things are so important. And so then, you know, that's when people do, you know determine that my my devices don't work. You know, situations like that. And it's very frustrating. <laughs> yeah. I, I would recommend that you, you always use four gauge. I mean, it may be tempting to use six gauge, which is finer wire, but this is a, has more structural integrity. It'll withstand the acid a little longer. Excuse me for interrupting, but uh, beavers get stuck in this stuff sometimes and drown. Um, not not usually. Th this is, you know, we're, we're, we, with this filter, we're, we have this thing called separation distance. We're not, we're not, we're not, we're not uh, blocking off a, a channel like we will when we put a fence on a culvert. So it, they, they don't, they have no reason to try to force their way through here. And so it doesn't usually happen. And the small beavers damming the pipe is, is I have not had that problem with, with the, these filters that are on pipe systems and beaver dams yet. But at culverts, beavers are often trying to, you know, they, they're more motivated to get through. And uh, they'll get one arm in there, and they'll get stuck. And if they're below the water line, they drown. So um, it's unfortunate, but uh, the, the other option, I mean, it happens, you know, in, in a, a very small minority of cases. And, of course, the other option, if you don't use a flow device, is that you have to kill all the beavers all the time. So you have, you have more mortality that way, obviously. So is this an issue when the two are just basically resting here? Yeah, it's, it's not a big deal. We can, we can do the ones on either side. Yeah, you do have to, you know, you have to be careful when you go around to make sure. You can always cut them shorter if you, if you haven't cut them, uh, if you've cut them too long, but it's hard to make them longer if you've cut them too short. The thing, we have a wealth in this country, a wealth of people that can build stuff. Um, and so that's not the issue. It's just getting that, that you know, the understanding of beavers and, and the mindset, yeah. But uh, there's no reason, there's no, you know, we could just do the whole continent if we got motivated to. We have the talent. But. We'll need another round fence. Yep. That's okay with you guys. Might as well do it now. 
before we get our waiters on. <laughs> what? Yeah, you guys, it's time for a shift change. That's true. Hey, Dave just reminded me of something. He said he was really, he was really glad to see so many fish and game people here. And I tip my cap to the tribes, and, and so I want to I want to do that the same to you guys. I really appreciate you coming and, and sort of being open-minded about you know new new uh, approaches to this issue. I, I I come at it simply as I said as a you know from an ecological standpoint. I'm losing I'm losing some of my audience here. <laughs> hey, I was just giving you guys compliments. Get back here. They don't like to hear hear that. <laughs> But anyways, it, it, it's really impressive because it is a controversial issue and uh, a lot of times it is sort of seen in this, uh, uh, you know, context of the struggle between animal welfare concerns and, and the, so the traditional wildlife managers. And I, I don't see it as, that way at all. I, I mean, I'm more from the traditional side and I'm a hunter and, and one, one of the things I learned as a hunter is you, you just don't kill needlessly and, and wastefully if you don't have to. But you know, from a very selfish, from a very selfish standpoint, these generally translate into a whole lot more game animals in the landscape, be it uh, ducks or fur bears or, or moose or, or whatever. I mean, even species like bears and and uh, and uh, deer, you know, uh, use wetlands to a, a high degree. <laughs> what? Well, I think you might have. Yeah, it's relatively shallow up in there. I think you may have had some backhoe action here at one point. It, it's, it's a little bit deeper in there. Hey, and and seeing, seeing we have so many good workers here, um, you know, this, this, we have to work right here. So somebody could volunteer to clean up these, uh, this stuff. You need a little handsaw. And uh, you, might need, you might need some rubber boots if you get down in there, or even waders. But uh, you can do some of it from dry land here, but we've got to get that out of our faces. Four and a half, right? Four and a half. Yep, great. Have we formed a good circle? Guys? <laughs> I'm gonna take my protractor. I'm gonna take my protractor out. <laughs> it's kind of it's yeah. Look at that big old piece of metal up there. That's a dangerous spot. There may be you know more stuff like that around. So we got to be careful as we stomp around in there. But but uh, you know somebody could get some waders on and kind of. You know, There's clean that out a little bit. Your right foot. I don't know what it is. Yeah, the, yeah it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a. And then, you know, you, you could, also somebody could go down to that beaver dam and the breach that I put in it can be, that can be dug deeper to get that much more water out of here. It'll just make our, our work easier. 18 and a half. Thank you very much. 18 and a half, 19. Uh, actually, it's it's n roughly 19. Okay. It's, it's it's actually a little less than 19. Okay. Yeah. Tough people. <laughs> this this uh this this style of filter. Let's just call it a a, fr a freestanding filter. It doesn't need a, a separate frame, and in that you know for that reason it's a really nice design. And a lot, a lot more easy, less time-consuming to build. But there's, you can also use wooden frames, which I do, you know, f fairly often. You can just build a square, a cube, and then staple the wire to it. So you know that requires no, no bending at all. Um, it's a little, a little it's more work involved. involved to, and I just use two by fours. More work involved, and uh, a little bit heavier, harder to move. The thing about these round fences is they're wheels. So if, if you have to if you have to get one way down in some remote area, you just push it along like this. It's really really easy to get it around. And, and another a third thing you can do. So you can build that wooden frame square filter without driving any posts. Just set it in the wetland, or you can go out and you can drive drive posts. You know I use two by fours usually. Just, you can drive posts and just build it piece by piece. 
uh, on your frame out there. And that's, you know, in, in every situation is different, but if it's a, if it's a real shallow spot and, and it's close to the road so you don't have to carry your materials very far, that, that's a pretty good way to do it too. Yes. Yeah, it's, I mean, just sort of dig around with a with a cultivator. I, I don't know how clogged it is. It may be, you know, it may be pretty clean now. Well, that thing's gigantic, but there might be something smaller around. Four. Yep. Okay. I'll, I guess I'll do two of those. Um, I'm just going to divide these into thirds, and hopefully they'll be tall enough. Uh, it doesn't give us a whole lot of room for driving. Okay. Could you go over the lengths again? What? Could you go over the lengths? Yeah. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> These are uh, 16 foot two by fours, and so I'm going to cut. I'm going to cut them in two different ways. I'm going to cut a couple into thirds, and and I and hope that the post, which will be about five feet, will be tall enough for our beaver deceiver. And then I'm going to cut the other ones in half because I need uh, uh, about eight, eight feet because I need braces to hold the pipe down on the pipe system, which is also called the caster master. I usually don't use these. I usually use something. Yeah. What the hell? The, the split band couplers? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I know, I know, but then we still need something to put them together. Would it be possible since these are kind of built in couplers to couple them and screw them? Is that an idea? Yep. Are you, there is a there is a bell on the end. Yes. <laughs> I don't. That's, that's not bell. So you think there's a bell underneath there? I I don't know if there's a bell underneath there. It doesn't look like it. No. Yeah. So we'll just leave it. We'll just work with this. We'll just leave it. Okay. Well, I'll give you a little. 
speech on pipes. Uh, the polyethylene is good for the reasons I mentioned earlier, but it, but it has some bad properties as well. And that, that's basically its buoyancy. Every one of these uh, things is a, a sealed inner tube of air. So you, you can never get the thing to sink if you didn't address that. Uh, in addition, even, even, even with that, they're still buoyant. So uh, you have to uh, stake them down. That's what some of these braces are for. I typically use diagonal braces over the top to hold the pipe down in place. Um, I, I guess they're more common back east, but I, I always use for couplers these things called split band couplers. Um, and they, they just wrap around the two ends of the pipe like this and they cinch them, cinch them with pull ties. And that's really the, the best way to do it. Because um, you're you know you're working in difficult situations and it's it's not not always easy to to uh, put these things together. Plus, with this design, they're they're designed to be covered with earth, so there's not as many forces trying to pull them apart. Obviously, in a stream that's a little greater. Um, but and and another thing is I need to run the circular saw along these pipes to put a kerf in these to let the air out. And so what we're going to do, we'll leave this on here, but there's going to be a, a series of these inner tubes right in there that's going to, it's going to be, want to rise up. But, but that's okay. We'll just stake it. You know, we'll stake it right near this, and we'll, we should be okay. Um, these are, these are uh, uh, what are these, eight, eight-inch pipes. Should be, should be fine, fine for this site. What do you do if your water is shallower than your <laughs> repeat the question. Well, it's, that's rarely the case. Repeat, I mean, please repeat, repeat the question. Oh, the, the question was, what, what, what do you do if the water is shallower than the pipe? And it's just, it's just not usually the case. Um, if it is, uh, you know, you, you just lay the pipe down on the floor on the substrate and stake it down. That is the case sometimes that when I do the combination systems at a, at a, at a uh, culvert site. But at a beaver dam, it's never the case because you actually, you know, you need some beaver dam as part of the system, you know, so you have, you always have some, unless the beavers leave and the thing degrades and drains out, you know, but typically you have some water there. I, I can't remember if I mentioned it, but, but the, the pipe system I use with the, these, these pipes and the round fence filter, I've named the, the caster master. Um, beavers are, are caster canadensis, as I'm sure most of you know. It's, I think it's important because, you know, you read about these flow devices, the terminology out there is just everybody uses something different, and it's very confusing. So I try to just mention what, what things are called. Um, don't know if it'll do any good, but... So this is going to go underneath the culvert? Uh, no. I mean through the culvert? No, th th we're going to put these, these pipes through the beaver dam. We're going to put two together, so we're going to have a 40-foot long pipe. And it's going to hump up over the beaver dam and end just downstream from the beaver dam and go upstream to a round fence. The pipe's going to go upstream to a... Yep. Yeah, the majority of the pipe is going to be upstream from the beaver dam because that, you know, that, that separation distance, the more you have, the more robust the system. We, it felt like there was a lot of silt in the pipe, in the culvert. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think there's anything we can do. You just, you know, hope it gets flushed out of there during the next uh, high water event. Uh, why wouldn't you just go ahead and break that beaver down in the middle, put it right down the middle, and the beaver, and the beaver can build up over top of it? I agree. Over it. Oh, oh, well, yeah, every, every site's different again, so that varies somewhat depending on your goals. But there's a, a couple reasons for the, uh, for the hump. Uh, one of which is, is you need to, the uh, downstream, uh, I mean the upstream end of your pipe it has to be underwater, okay, because beavers are going to, they're, they're stimulated to dam when they hear running water. So if that, was a, if that was level, let's say, and there was a little waterfall going out the downstream end of the pipe, that noise would be transmitted right to the, to the open air at the upstream end. So you can't have that. So you have to have your water level. You have to try to control your water level higher than your intake, okay. So that's that's one reason for that hump. That that's a, that's the, that's the control, and that's higher than your intake. And the other reason is, you know, you, you typically you want to you want to maintain as much beaver dams as you can, 
as defense against new beaver dams immediately above stream, as I said before. So that's, you know, the beaver dam's up a little bit. You have to go over it. Another reason for the hump. Any other questions? When's lunch? <laughs> Um, I, I guess, I, you know, I, I need to run a circular saw down these pipes, so uh, I, I, I use a cordless, cordless saw, 18 volt, and a cordless drill. That's a, that's a good, good tools because I'm always in remote areas, but, but for today we're going to use a generator. <laughs>